Whenever Welcome you're ready. Welcome everyone to the final episode of Diphoria. My name is Vedius. I'm subbing in for Dracos as he's gone home to his family or something. I don't know. Uh, and Kobe and Kadrel are here as regular guests. How are you both doing? They're high fiving right now. We're doing great. Thank you for asking, man. Full of energy, <laughs> I can see. I'm really happy to have you here as our host today. Yeah. I appreciate um, that. I was really looking forward to today. Yeah. And uh, it's just an honor to be here. I'm really happy man i'm really happy we've done a euphoria together before we you have. had a wonderful time yeah. um let's see if we can give kobe that same experience shall we <laughs> he's in a euphoria sandwich right now he certainly is right so before we move on to affairs i do have to give a big shout out to merch.riotgames.com for supporting us all throughout worlds while there's still some products still available online a reminder that your best bet for those of you in san francisco to grab it is here at the chase center this weekend our producer is on a quest to get kobe some joggers so far, he's failing that quest. Failing. 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 So. Uh, <laughs> I heard they were all sold out. Yeah, well, we'll see. I'm sure he knows a guy <laughs> who knows a guy. Are they nice joggers? You want the joggers? They're nice? Yeah. I like joggers. Well, actually, I haven't I haven't gotten them yet. So this is what you guys thought. Just this is how you open? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well. Well, last time it was about our hotel experiences. So yeah. how, how has your hotel experience been so far, Betty? It's been great. Yeah, it's I've great really here. enjoyed the hotel here is wonderful. I like San Francisco the most of any city that we've been to so far. True and based. Mainly due to the lack of congestion. Um, <laughs> and I feel like nice things to do. And there's water. Yeah, the no, there's water the nose, is there. Right? There's water. Yeah, me and Betty didn't realize that San Francisco is next to the ocean. So as we were <laughs> flying over, we were like, so what is, <laughs> why is all just these a big puddles lake? everywhere? We're still flying over water, Wes. <laughs> yeah. When they got off, they asked me, why is there so much water here? What's the big lake? I was yeah. like, do you mean the ocean? <laughs> the Pacific? And we're like, is that a lake? <laughs> yeah, um, it was pretty funny. Anyway, so to kick us off, gentlemen, I wanted to break the ice, you know, because with me being here, you're probably not that familiar with me. You don't know who I am. So no, I, I have to, no idea who you are. I wanted to ease us in. It's just an icy wall exactly. right here. Yeah, and so I wanted to we, break that wall. With a chisel. I wanted to break that wall so that we could get closer to one another, right? So I've got some fun facts prepared, Yeah. right? And the first few fun facts, maybe Kobe knows the answer to. Okay? Are, how fun are they? They're really fun. I like, know the answer to every single one. I'll get them all right. Well, so the first ones are about San Francisco. Because we're here. Are for we the on a team? Yeah, you two can be on a Easy. team. Nice. Easy. But for the League of Legends ones, you will not be on a team. Okay. okay? But for the San Francisco ones, right? Maybe so, people at home can play along. There is, okay, a park here in San Francisco. Yeah. Do you know the name of the park? No. Kobe? Um, Stop googling parks. <laughs> There's a lot of parks. <laughs> Huntington Park, P Pioneer Park. Do you know the Golden Gate Park? Oh yeah, the, the oh, Gigi yeah. Park. The there Gigi Park. Yeah, yeah, did yeah. you know that it is bigger than Central Park? I did. You really? Not know that. That's pretty really cool. <laughs> That's, thanks that for was name, a fun fact. Here, yeah, I've got another one this for you. This man asked us, did you know there's a park in San Francisco? I did. Yeah. Okay, let's keep the flow going. Okay, did you, did you know this? we're loosening up now. <laughs> we're getting there. Right. Next fun fact: the right. city has its own fog. Did you know that it has a name? Its own fog. Its own fog. Well, like and the, the thing fog in the sky? has a name. San Francisco fog. No. SF it's fog. way cooler final than that. Final answer. That's your final answer? The San Francisco <laughs> fog? The fog is named Carl. Apparently from the movie Carl? Big Fish. Yeah, Carl. I'm telling you, this is a what fun is fact. Going on? There is a fog Am I named dreaming? Carl. I'm not having What's no, happening? I'm <laughs> being serious. Okay, Carl, next okay. fun fact. Did you know that the Chinese fortune cookie was born here in San Francisco. I did See, know that. Fedius, I have a question. I thought this was about getting together to know you better. No, it's about you? breaking the ice. That's what this is about. Okay. And right now I feel the ice is being broken <laughs> no. rapidly. We're global warming this stuff up. You know what I mean? You know, the last episode also, because we had only slept like two hours each. Yeah. We were just also chugging caffeine. We're right. super jacked up on caffeine. So I just remembered the main goal I have is to not interrupt people. Oh. So I'm gonna wait until both of you top speak. Stop speaking fully. That's good to know. I'll interrupt you. I'll, I'll just raise my hand. I'll okay, interrupt you. Great. Kobe, sentence. stop speaking because I have another fun fact. <laughs> this is the final San Francisco fun fact that I have. Okay. okay. So the San Francisco Bay is home to a few marine life, Kobe. Do you know what marine life it is? It's big and it's dangerous. Sharks. What type of shark? Whale sharks. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Kobe. Tiger sharks. No, it's the great white shark. I mean, it's Wait, not- Wait, in that ocean? Not in the bay. Really? Apparently. Not in the bay. Wait, San Francisco dude, bay, the bay is home to quite a few we're, great we're white sharks. We're on an island surrounded by water. So we're surrounded by sharks. I've literally been on boats out in the bay. There's great white sharks actually in the bay. That's what my fun fact says. That's also not fun. That's Apparently scary. none of them I are I never go in that ocean anymore. None of them are man -eating. Not that I did go in it. I knew that I knew they're up and down on the coast. But they're here too. They're literally that water over there that they can't see on the camera that we're just describing. There's a bunch of great white sharks in there. 
You're wow. welcome. Another fun fact that we learned when we went to the uh, Atlanta. Wow, this is a lot aquarium. of fun facts. But ours was more fun because we went. Or actually, we didn't even meet up with you guys. You guys didn't want to see. No, us. we went separately. This is ad lib right now. We didn't prepare this fun fact, but let's see where it goes. Go on, Kobe. <laughs> Most of the uh, sharks' bodies are made of cartilage, not bones. True. So much more flexible. What's the percentage of a shark's body that is their liver? What is going on? That's today? not the percentage. Can yeah, I know. Help? I'm asking you a question. What is I happening? don't know what They're the percentage. Twenty five percent. I was told you I'm here. Isn't for that twenty five percent oil? I was told twenty five percent liver. Okay. Come here and do a leak anyway, podcast. Anyway, now oh, we have does? league related questions. Oh, okay. 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 So this is actually like a quiz. Yeah. And you two are now competing here. against each other. You have to raise your hand. I don't no have yelling. a t shirt underneath this. Okay. So no raising. Okay. okay. On, no yelling. Yes. Only... Okay. So you're like the class teacher. Yeah. Okay. okay. So which champion has 100% pick ban? Aatrox. That's correct. Which champion has a 100% win rate? Eh. Yumi. Yumi. <laughs> yeah, so we start off with the easy one. I would just like good. to say he's not raising his hand. He's For, making, I'm a making a buzzer sound. He's making a beepy noise. It's the same. He's making a listen, noise. everyone at home, listen. That's what happens if I touch the table. Okay. Okay. Next question. He said raise hand. How many world championships have Deft and Faker been a part of? Seven. Kobe. Six. I including this one. Oh, both of them at the same time. I'm asking. Wait. How many world championships have Deft and Faker been a part of? They must be the same number, so... At the same time? Combined? Or? Just answer the question, Kobe. Is, is it combined, or is I'm it not, just... Just give me a number. Uh, seven. Six. The answer is seven. Good job, yeah. Kedron. I'm impressed. So far, it's <laughs> three for three. Yeah. This next one is not going to be easy, okay? Both Faker and Deft are leading all players in games played at Worlds and kills. Yeah. Okay? Can either of you tell me how many kills Faker or Deft has had and how many games I know Faker the games. or Deft has had? I know the games. Ah. So Faker has had 100, I'll give you to the nearest 10. 106 games is what Faker's played. The kills. The at kills. You, sir, we are saw this. way off. In games, games at Worlds played? Didn't we have a stat? Oh, no, you're right. No, no, no. You're right, you're right. You're right. Sorry, I was confusing the two. You're right. You're yes. wrong. Yeah. I was wrong. So games played. I have games played and I have kills secured. Yes. Faker has 106 games played. Yeah. So... You're slightly wrong, but you're close. What about you, Kobe? I don't know why I said that. I should have given you a chance to answer. 351. You can't just Google this, man. Kills. 351 kills for At who? World. For, for Faker. Unfortunately, that's incorrect. Closer. <laughs> that's not what this says. Well, according to my stat stock, the answer is 385 kills for Faker all time. See. And the number of games is 110 for Faker. So you were see, very we close. did a graphic because yeah. I remember total games played at Worlds and yeah. Faker was 103 on the analyst desk. And he 3 0 JDG. So he must have 106. And how many games did he know? He didn't 3 0 JDG. He 3 1 JDG. Oh, yeah. So it must be 107. Well, apparently it's 110 now. Mm, I'm not I'm, sold. I'm I not was, sold. I had these confirmed last night. Okay. Okay. What is that? Is the, where the hell did you get that? Can you get mic? it together, please, Kobe? I thought you just pulled like something that, else. I'm just glad <laughs> that this is a backup mic. Because... <laughs> Kobe, can, can you put the mic down so we can continue, please? We've got to talk about a lot of things today. Okay, great. Just like... All right, there's two quick questions nice. left, okay? Okay. So this Saturday, Faker or Deft will be the oldest ever world champion. Yes, 26 years old. Who will they be taking that title from? Who will they be taking that title from? Who will they be... So who was the previous olded, oldest I would world say champion? Can I have two guesses? You can have one guess. Because this is really hard. Oh. No, it's not. Can, is, it, I know. is it Mata? You know. know. Mata? It makes sense. Okay, go on. Do you think it's Mata? You think it's the correct answer is ambition, yes. <laughs> but he's just Googling the answers. I hope well, you know I, that. I already had this open. I already had this open. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have open? He has tabs of how many kills <laughs> Faker has, the age work. of players. It was correct. It was prep work. Yes. These are all things that you should know. I don't have a laptop and future. I feel betrayed. All right. I've got a question for you. And you should know this. That's you're not how this works. I have one more question. Yeah. <laughs> don't. This is a quiz show. Me. I like this. Not, you, Final you question. Okay. Faker currently is the youngest player to ever win a world champion at eh, 17 wrong. years old. Wrong. There is one exception to that. <laughs> assuming Cyanide. you count. You had to ruin the fun, didn't you? <laughs> he answered a bunch before you finished. Is that the also question? on your list? Yeah, it is. It, it must be. 
I just remember. I was there. <laughs> I was remember. there. I was there. Season yeah, it says one. it right there. It says it right there. <laughs> I was there. Fanatic cyanide, 16 years, 217 days. That's correct. I was there I with COT. 17 days. They I kicked me off the starting roster, but they still took me to Worlds. Okay, well, that's Take the end of my quiz. I also played in the Riders versus Pro show match on the side of the pros. Because uh, I was a pro at the time. Are you familiar with the top lane champion that, pl that uses scissors? Yes. Can you name it for me? Gwen, did I ask? Correct. That is the correct answer. Thank you very much. So good one. Good one. that was good. I'm glad that we broke the ice. Okay. We're all feeling comfortable now and we're getting ready. Yeah, so yeah, let's talk some analysis. JDG versus T1. Okay. Let's do a bit of a recap for those that don't know. Spoiler alert. T1 won. <laughs> um, what were your thoughts? What were your initial impressions of the games and general uh, overall opinions? Hmm. I think the games were very, the first couple of games were very back and forth. Yeah. I think we saw a series which was like incredibly bloody, which I didn't really expect. Yeah, very it. bloody. I don't have the stat for it, but it was, was a lot of kills. I think we, there was some stat of like a kill a minute roughly throughout the entire series. I didn't expect how back and forth it would be. But then I think JDG just collapsed the longer the series went on. Kobe. SKT also came into the series. T1. As T1. <laughs> Fair. T1 also came into the series with the highest combined kills per minute of any team already at Worlds. So they, mm. they were already the bloodiest team. Mm. And then this game was even crazier. Sure. Yeah. Like over a kill per minute. Also, <clears throat> the, the aggression that they played with, I felt like was supported by both their mechanics. Uh, there were just so many moments watching the series where you see the them sidestepping skill shots that are fired from like point blank, like right in front of them. Mm. Um, as well as some of the drafts. I like how they really like to play the entire map. They have all these globals, you know, the, the gangplank. They even pulled out the Nocturne. I think yep. that could be big in games versus DRX, mm. um, especially because little picks like that with Nocturne Ultimate that are going to change the way that you actually play uh, play mid game can be so big for best of fives like that. Yeah, I think those pocket picks will help T1 a lot and DRX will struggle, but we'll talk about DRX a little bit later on. I think the thing that interested me the most is if you watch the Damwon Gen G series, it was Damwon who was answering Lucian Nami with Aphelios Lulu, mm -hmm. and it worked until that game five, of course, but that's what got them slowly back into the series. And it's T1 <laughs> who picked Lucian Nami into Aphelios Lulu every game. They just thought the opposite, you know? Uh, JDG well, were the ones picking it, but what actually happened from my point of view was Lucian Nami always got mid push. and. I feel like um, Hope and Missing were struggling to ever get mid push in the mid game, and Hope was always overstepping on mid waves and dying for no reason, which just unlocked the whole map to give T1 like huge advantages. That on top of the globals, so you have side lane pressure as well as mid push because you're making mistakes in mid, just means that T1 just ran them over. I think the first couple games that didn't happen as much, but the longer the series went on, I feel like every single time Camille or, or any side laner came towards mid or Lucian dashed forwards, Hope would just die or Missing would lose his flash, and it was impossible to fight through mid. I think for JDG. Kobe. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I just remember the entire series feeling like bot diff was just a snowball that started to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And their confidence to pick the Lucianami into them over and over came from th three failures of attempted mm. laning phase of Aphelios Lulu. Uh, I actually just think that's player skill difference because talking to like Double Lift and a bunch of other uh, like, act, uh, you know, pro players that are active right now, mm. their their opinions based on the on the Ophelios Lulu matchup are a lot about like skill diff in the early lane phase that if it's actually gonna answer. And then in the final one, you can see them, basically if you're early picking the karma for your bottom lane and then pick it with Jin, you're just saying, oh shit, we are getting bot diff too hard. Please, we just need to survive, yep. right? That That is a double poke like, let me get three health potions and boots to start lane phase because we're just getting gapped mm -hmm. so hard by mm -hmm. Guma and Karia. I felt like it was a lot of skill gap instead of uh, like champion matchup. I don't know. So I will say that I believe there was twice in that series that Guma and Karia died straight up 2v2 to Hope and Missing. Yeah, there. I will say that like... It was on that, a tower, no? Bot no, tier one. like straight up level two, Guma Yushi like walked into melee range of the Lulu and like he got slowed and then he just got killed like in lane. And mm. I remember it was like game two, I think, because I was just looking at Kobe being like, huh? Wasn't there a time where I think, yeah, they, they, there was a second time where a similar thing kind of happened, right? Yeah, yeah they're he, like the, in 2v2, like I think it happened twice. It happened in game two and I think it happened. I haven't rewatched the games mm. yet, but I think it was either in game three. I don't think it was in game four. But they still came back and slammed them. Yes, they did. And I think that that's important. Like 
overall, I think it's very fair to say that Guma and Carrier played better in that series than Hope and Missing did, right? Especially when we look in the mid game as you are. Especially out of laning phase. Yes, especially out of laning phase. Um, but to me, I think that this is a characteristic of Guma that it's kind of like, he reminds me of Hilly in a weird way. And like the, if you don't love him at his worst, you can't love him at his best, right? Mm. He is typically an aggressive player that will try to fight and find his own leads. And sometimes that ends up biting him. And I think you mentioned it on the cast, Kobe, where like he's a player that enjoys playing on the edge. And so playing on the edge will sometimes lead you to fall off if you're going to consistently play on that edge. And I think that it's one of those things that is just important to be mindful of. But that's not to say that it's a fall of his because the high highs that he gets um, as a result of that uh, are worth it. But sometimes there are situations where it can blunder and it can hurt him. Yeah, I was watching, uh, reviewing some some of the games yesterday, and there's a couple of different scenarios where T1 just don't respect some vision of their opponents, and then like they give up a couple kills. I was just trying to go back and find any little ways that like D I can see for DRX to to upset them and and win. And I think some of those like hubris plays where you're so full of confidence. That that's what I love about this T1 team. They're so full of confidence. They're playing so aggressively. Sometimes they don't wait for sweeper cooldowns to move in. They're over vision. Uh, there was one play where they were towards mid lane and and they got caught. That was like the one game they lost versus JDG. Hmm. Um, and then the play where Gumiushi on Lucian moves up to try and catch Silas, but Silas goes in fog of war and hits him with the uh, ever frost. Mm. Yes. And then he dies. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like yeah. those types of things where you're playing, you know, so aggressively, not really respecting uh, yeah. the lack of information. It's it's hard to find weaknesses in a team who's like world finalist, right? One of the best in the world, but you yeah. can sometimes turn strength, strengths of a team into weaknesses. So if I think of one of the strengths of T1 is their Baron calls have been really good this tournament. They are very yeah. conscious of time windows that they have and time frames that they have to finish where enemy team is, TP uh, situation, and just like rushing down barons when you don't expect it. So DRX could actually use that against them a little bit where T1 get a little bit overconfident on baron starts, uh, where DRX are like not specifically putting vision around it, hovering around bot side, but they're very aware that, you know, T1 might rush Nash. This could backfire a little bit. That's just one example of something that you could just take a strength and turn into a weakness. Sure. On the Gumayushi point, I think I was talking to you about this before. I don't know if that's your replies to me on that topic, but just quickly is um, in the regular season, I think a big reason why he fell off and people thought that he wasn't as good was one, the expectation was from MSI that he's the best bot lane in the world next to Carrier. Yeah. So if you don't live up to that expectation, you're already worse than you are. And second was, I mean, yeah, his lane phase has always been a little bit weak in the, in the regular season in the LCK. He would always either overstep, take a bad trade, lose a summoner, lose pots, sit on the tower, have to call his jungler. And that affected carry a lot. And also in team fights, when he's playing things like Lucian and Zeri and Kalista, champions with mobility, he would always dash just a little bit too far forwards and just get caught and die. Or he would never dash at all and do nothing in the fight. Didn't happen every game, but those are just the, the weaknesses that showed when he plays things like Aphelios and Jinx, he's really confident. You know, he can play max range, play to hyper carry, scale up, have a time Kench next to him. But when he's, he's the one reliant on making the plays, I felt like that's where Gumayushi was missing to become the best AD carry in the world. And that's why the meta shift hurt him a lot, I think. Also, the mixture of like, now your lane phase is not just a Filios Jinx handshake. You're playing Kalista. You have to get a lead, stack waves, dive bot. becomes a lot more complicated. I think those nuances just made it so he didn't look as good as he was. Uh, but now he just looks insane. But he seems I to think have he found scales really now, well right? through the tournament. Yeah. Yeah. He's still making a couple of mistakes in the lane phase, like you talked about. But most of it's been brushed away. And that's the thing. I think it's important that like, Mistakes are always going to happen in league, but we're yet to see. I mean, outside of that one where he got caught in mids with the Everfrost, I would say like we're yet to see any like game losing plays from him. And again, I don't want to like harp too much on him in particular. Did did you have something you wanted to add about Gumiyushi? Mm -hmm. I actually just wanted to say through all of this, Karia Karia was my MVP for that whole series. Yeah, I, I think as as much as there were like only small tweaks you could give to Guma, I like. Carrier has just been magnificent. He's so good. It's his a, team fights on Nami, he was hitting every bubble, every crucial bubble, saving his teammates, engaging. Like the Renata was, I mean, it's a basically it was game a highlight winning. reel. I, I just watched the game yesterday. His Renata was game winning, both the series versus RNG and JDG. Well, was... I think both these teams, you can make an argument that Beryl and Carrier are the MVPs for their respective teams this tournament. I think there's a very hey, solid argument there. Don't jump ahead too yet. We'll get to Derek soon enough. Yeah. I see you jumping Yeah, Zeka as well. Insane. But I think Hang there on. is an argument for Beryl as well. This guy has been so good this tournament. Almost like an unsung hero, I so, think. So the one thing I did want to talk about was the JDG versus T1 matchup. I think a lot of people expected it to be pretty close, mm. right? 
And the reason why I felt that was because one of JDG's biggest strengths was their ability to team fight and the way in which they played mid game, right? The, the way in which they controlled vision was one of the best in the world, in my opinion. The, the way in which they were so good at setting up waves in advance so that they the waves would hit the right point that gave them the windows to set up vision around Dragon or Herald or Baron or whatever it was and then play around that was just super good. Um, what impressed me more was how T1, kind of in game one, they went for like a pick style comp, which ended up being a lot of team fighting, which they then realized that they couldn't win as JDG just kept out team fighting them. And like, Kedro, this was something that maybe you have the most recent experience of, but to watch a team go from, okay, we're not gonna team fight them anymore. We're just gonna avoid playing for five on five anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, like, have you ever been in an environment where you go backstage and like, we can't beat them 5v5, we have to split push or something? Because that seemed to be the switch to me for T1, mm. where they just changed the whole approach to the game and they were like, this is the best way for us to win. And it wasn't like a novel way that they play the game because Faker roaming, Zeus on a strong side, that's not new to T1, right? But the way in which they played it was something that we really haven't seen a lot of this World Championship at all. Yeah, I think they probably, from my experience, they probably scrimmed a couple of Camille Gallio games and their idea was to pull it out in game one thinking that this is going to be a surprise, not cheese, but surprise strategy of just full hard engage that you can't deal with because they knew that they would match Lulu into Lucian yeah, Nami. Yeah. And if you're playing double immobile carry on midwave against Camille Vi Galio, you're going to die on every midwave. Right. Uh, that's why it was so bloody, that first game especially. I think they realized after game one that their strategy worked, but they can't play Lucian Vi Camille Galio into, into Talia. It's unplayable. Right. Because you can get picks, yes, but in raw 5v5s, it's, there's some things in League that you can't overcome with skill. And like that Talia is just a good example of it. You know, uh, you think about even the Baron starts, they couldn't even get over the wall on the turn in a 5v3 because Talia just puts her E in the Nash pit, right? Like Gumuyushi can't follow, Zeus can't follow. And that's just the nature of the champion, how they interact. You know, another example is playing Sejuani into Tom Kench and that's your only form of engage. It's so unreliable. And how are you ever supposed to start a fight if you can just match ults with this? And then what's the Sejuani gonna do now that she's just QR'd in, right? So I think T1, I wouldn't be surprised if they played it in a game five. Camille Gallio is more of like a red side kind of draft, in my opinion. Uh, the only times it was a good blue side draft was when there was no real counter switch. But I feel like now with Fiora Jax being meta, it's actually kind of easy to counter uh, Camille Gallio. Sure. So I'm surprised they did it on blue side, but um, they just probably had the strat in mind where Aphelios Lulu is the answer to Lucian Nami when Yumi's down. And this is going to be the way that they deal with midwave. But to me, gonna... the way that they then moved away from that and then hard committed into the one through one yeah. is the thing that impressed me the most. Because it felt like that they had a style in game one and then they immediately just said, this isn't it. We don't want to do this anymore. And I felt like that, that was the first time we really saw JDG as a team be like torn apart. Like often when they were when they were losing domestically, they were like getting smashed in the early game and they were just too far behind because they were a team that would always try to fight you. And But T1 literally just never allowed them to fight. We Like in that Rise game, we just didn't get to see any 5v5s because T1 never let them. Yeah, I was going to say, I could answer your question from the other side where you were like, oh, have you ever been in a situation where you didn't want to team fight the team anymore and you just want to split push? When we were playing versus SK, we're like, we can't handle their twisted fate. Like we can't handle their split push because we can only team fight and so we just started banning that and there were less globals back in the game then. Right. So it was easier to just ban out split push. But that sort of, you know, diversion and staying true, uh, staying true to your, uh, your style of playing the game, I think is important. Mm. Yeah, there's many ways you can look at split push. Uh, it's like you can imagine one three one as like side lane pressure in which your mid lane has to answer. So the best way to answer is pushing mid, right? So sure. if I push in mid, then both sides have to be scared. You can think of it as like the enemy team playing through side by over committing on one side. Uh, I think there's a game that's a very good example of that. I think it's off the top of my head. I can't remember. It was like a Jarvan draft. I'll remember it off in a couple of minutes, but they basically just, their only play was to just gank side lanes no matter what. That was it. Uh, and you can never go through mid. I have to recall which game that was, but anyway. If it's Jarvan, it sounds like a rogue game. <laughs> yeah, I think it was a rogue game, you know, uh, where they just have to permanently gank that side lane. Uh, anyway, nevertheless, I'll check in in a sec. Uh, and you have to gank side and you play two man through that side lane. Another example of that is like RNG T1 where the Silas is hovering top, right? You just play two men on one side lane. So yeah. That's how you can do it. And then you could also have champs like Camille who push the side and go towards mid and then try to start fights. But I think the main thing of split push is you have two lanes of push that's not mid and it's always going to be sides. That's just basically how split push works. Sure. Uh, and you either make the enemy team respond to your waves or you make them back off mid wave because they're scared because you're collapsing. Uh, this is the two biggest benefits of it. But you always have to be ready to be able to match numbers on a side lane if you want to split push. So a, a very easy way to digest that is 
you cannot push both sides if you don't have both TP or like your support yeah. jungle hovering to that one side. Sure. And there's one thing I learned in Excel. It's a concept, but the way we labeled it was quite funny. It's called the Hooney Baron. So what you basically do is you have a side laner that's strong and beats the enemy side laner, right? So yeah. they need to commit two or three numbers to kill that side laner. So like laner. the Yone, for example. Yone, for example. Against Malphite, he's going to win. So yeah. you need your jungle, uh, Belveth, you need your support maybe as well to go down there to help kill him. And when they three-man him, you start Nash's four, right? Because they're trying to deal with your split pusher. That's another example of how you can use uh, side lane. I mean, people, lots of people will see their... The, a game where a top laner just pushes bot and dies and then they get Baron on the other team and they're laughing at him like, why would you die? Well, the only reason they can get that Baron is because he's doing this, you know? Right. So you can use it in many different ways to like pressure the map, I think. That's why I think the globals are going to be so important for this finals because T1 have used so many global picks. They already showed the Gangplank top. Faker keeps playing a lot of Rome champs. The Galio, the Rise, he, he's well-equipped to pull back out. Sure. And then Nocturne pick, I was hoping maybe like DRX can use it to deny T1 because T1 try and play so aggressively. And mm -hmm. one of the strategies you're talking about is picking off people as they're trying to play sides. If you have Nocturne, it's way easier to quickly pick them off before before you can match that play because then you can't teleport during the Nocturne ultimate either. And you can get to them so quickly, they don't have time to burn Baron. So we all agreed T1 was very impressive overall. Is there anything you want to say before we move on to the next semifinal? Mm. No? It's it's really hard to find flaws in T1. Like a team yeah. that can play weak side top, strong side top, weak side bot, strong side bot. And Faker is a player who's been around for so long that you can slot him into any role. Yep. I think a lot of people still think of him as like this supportive player, but I think he's gone through the phases of like early career, super carry assassin style of the way the meta works yep. into a, like a Galio Lissandra kind of player, set up supportive player into now a leader. I think he's just someone who can pick anything and will do... Uh, pick any champ in any situation to make his team strong. And if the meta is Akali Silas, he'll play Akali Silas. So, this is one of the things that... So what T1 has kind of shown to me is that in order to be world champion, you need like top three in your role everywhere, right? Like worldwide, mm. right? Because if you can play through anything and your, champ and your players have a deep enough champion pool, the meta will never affect you. And you can just basically play whatever you want in any style that you want. And you're the most flexible team in the world. And then I think back to previous world champions where I'm like, the meta was a large part of what made them successful, right? I think of like Invictus Gaming back in 2018, the fact that the meta was all about the two solo lanes. It was like Akali Silas back then. I think it was Aatrox, Aatrox Urgot, Chase, Aurelia, yeah. right? Like it was the shy and the rookie year where no one was as good as them. Not it, the rookie, rookie. Rookie, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's because I said the shy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But um, the... And they even had Jackie Love on their roster, right? So it's not like they had a bad AD carry either. <laughs> but another psychopath. Yeah. <laughs> a team of psychopaths. But um, I then think about like um, when EDG won last year, Flandre was not considered the best top laner in the world, but it was a meadow where he was actually enabled and he was on a situation Thank where God he could for that be Graves good, pick. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, I got Graves, one. Yeah. I'm fine. Oh, yeah, Flandre it, Graves, but yeah. it, it's what then brings me back to this faker topic and like what's so impressive about him and T1 in general, is they find players that can get to a point where they can just play anything and everything. Mm. And like, we've seen many world champions succeed because of the meta. And that's not to take anything away from them, right? Them being the best at the time for that tournament, like that totally makes sense. And they were very deserving of that title. But I cannot get over the fact that Faker just keeps coming back. And it doesn't matter what the meta is or what the play style is. Sure, he's had his like down periods, but he finds a way to come back. And that to me is mind-blowing the fact and, that he can do that and putting it into proportion it's weird like for example i was a pro for four years i've been casting now for two years yep. and i'm still four years off what pro faker's pro career looks like after winning a world championship yep so like to gauge it in your head like 10 yeah. years is a very long it's time a really long time you know and he's still going uh it's really really impressive one thing i want to touch on quickly before i move on is is there something you want to say on faker before i do my other no, I think everybody, everybody's well aware how impressive yeah, Faker is. I don't think I'm going to drop any bombs. <laughs> he's very good. <laughs> to, to let people know. Before we move on to DRX, I had this like form of a hot take and I want to see what you thought about yeah, it. Yeah, go on. So you just talked about like how metas can change teams to make them stronger than they previously were, for example, yeah. right? Or mm -hmm. like a meta can hurt a team or, or help a team a lot. For sure. I think Damwon is the best, if not the second best team of the tournament, despite losing to Genji. Now, it's, it might sound a little bit surprising. I don't know what you'll think, but I think their meta read was just terrible going into that series. If you imagine a series where 
first of all, they don't make mistakes in the game one or two. And they ban away things like the Yumi, right? So they have a better read coming into it and they just respond to the Fido Zulu into Lushinami from the get go. Do you think they would have beaten Genji? And then do you think they would have put up a better fight against DRX? I don't. So, now, a lot of people will know me as a Damwon fanboy. I'm not doing this intentionally <laughs> because this is a non biased take because I, genu <laughs> I, gen I genuinely think that from watching all of the games back, Damwon impressed me the most in how they play the game sure. and their flexibility and their strength of mid their mid jungle strength is, I think, the best mid jungle in tournaments. Sure. Right? And what, I think that's what wins you a world championship. That I would agree with. I don't know about saying they're the, they're the best team in the tournament, but I do agree on if the, not ba second. the bad meta so, take yeah. as well as having the best mid jungle. Yeah. I think those are both. What I will say is that that is a very pro player slash analyst way of thinking about it. In that like, there's a lot of times where we, all three of us have done it and pros have done it and people will do it in the future where you'll say, even though a team lost, they were the better team. Right. Hmm. And often it comes from a place of like, you look at how the game is played, and often you feel like team A lost rather than team B won. And yep. it's a bit of a weird concept to get your head around because it's not just looking at the results, it's kind of looking at the game and the argument of, well, if they just done this thing slightly different, then the outcome would have been different. And then the, the ultimate, well, they didn't do that. Therefore, yep. they weren't better, yep. right? And it's like, well, yeah, true. Uh, I mean, that's kind of the absolution of the world championship in that we don't have a loser's bracket, unfortunately. I know you and I were talking that like, if if there was one, you and I would actually put down one as favorites to make the whole run through the lower bracket and we think yeah, that they yeah. would make the finals, right? Um, but it's it's a hard one to gauge because at the end of the day, they did lose. Their meta read was bad and being able to read the meta is a part of what makes you a good team. Mm. So like, I understand your point in terms of play style. This team understands the game at an unbelievably high level and canyon is in my opinion one of the best players in the world right now at least based on this tournament i know his regular season wasn't the the best but um he was insanely good at this tournament um but it's it's hard to justify because yep. being a meta read is part of what makes you a good team and if you can't read the meta properly then it's it's your own shortcomings, right? I would also say when you're matching up teams on paper, the this is the reason why the DRX story is is so amazing. Yeah. Because even though, if, yeah, yeah, if we match them up and we're like, okay, next, assuming Damwon wins, let's have them play DRX. Mm. And I'd be like, I would predict, if you're just going by numbers, I would predict Damwon, but that you have to leave room for these crazy breakout performances right. from the players. And like, Zeka completely hulking out. Pioshik is mm -hmm. playing so much better than you would ever give him credit for. Right? 100%. This so guy you, went two and 16 it, in a regular season yeah, last year. Exactly. So, so, what am I supposed to say? So, so while, while on paper, I'll be like, yeah, yeah, okay, you know, I, I fall wrong, right? That's, that's good logic. You have to have, yeah. you know, leave room for those things. And that's why. Uh, and that's, that's the biggest thing for me because based on that logic, based. DRX shouldn't be where they are right now. No, of right? course not. Because when we look at like the better team, right? Like, I remember casting that game with Azale, and in between the games, right, like after game two, we were convinced it was going to be a 3-0 because we felt like the EDG was playing better league, right? After the first two games, in my head, I felt like the EDG was just playing better than DRX was. Yep. And then they reverse sweep them. And I'm just like, now I feel kind of conflicted yep. because I feel like that DRX didn't necessarily play the best league I've ever seen and like certain things went wrong and then EG kind of collapsed. So then coming into the Gen G series, I thought it was going to be a quick 3-0. I thought that DRX kind of got a little bit lucky, not to mm. say they didn't deserve it. And then they beat them too. And it was just kind of like a, well, at some point, I'm just, my analysis is faulty and I'm clearly just underrating what it is that they do because they're doing something right. And then there will be people, and I know because we've had this conversation of, well, did Gen G collapse? Or was this DRX playing very good? And I'm sure if you like, I'm sure there's a bit of A and a bit of B, yep. right? Agreed. Because I know there was a lot of criticism towards Chovy and his impact and, and so on and so forth. And we'll talk about that. But like, it's a tough one, right? And I think that people will underestimate DRX coming into the final. And then imagine if they do that again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I was just, it's very hard to measure through hindsight as well, especially. Correct. Um, but that was just my general basis of like a hot take in a way, right? Where I think, the League of Legends that Damwon played was impressive. And it depends what you define as a team. Do you define the team as the five players or do you define the team as the coach as well or like the way that they draft as well? Is it from when the game starts or is it from when the draft starts? I mean, of Fair. course, it's normally from when the draft starts, right? That's a team. But the five players from the start of a game, I think were top two at Worlds. Uh, I think T1, is, it's hard to argue that T1, they're, they're better than T1. But my opinion was that I think Damwon 
would be a finalist if they if they took that Gen G series. I don't know what happened to Gen G before he moved to DRX. They just collapsed. Like Chovy, as much as he did that, he did that like <laughs> highlight iconic choking moment. I don't think he was choking. Like there's things where he said like he saw Varus on the map, he thought Flash Ult was coming and stuff like this. But like Lehens, Chovy, and Doran, they didn't really do uh, no Peanut. Peanut didn't yeah. do much at all in this series. Where right. was he? Yes. I also want So he's on the side of he thinks Genji collapsed. What do you think? Um I also I also wanted to give credit as as far as these like other areas to give credit to DRX for, since they have overcome so much this year a, as a team, mm. you know, they're so close, they trust each other so much. The the mental of actually playing these games and best of fives on world stage, you also have to add in the factor. Because again, if you're looking at it on paper, you know, you're playing League of Legends in a box, no pressure or whatever. And you're looking at these individual pieces and you're like, oh, yeah, Dom want better. Right. But if you if you look at the the mentality and, and they talked about in the interview as well, where Zeka was saying Barrel made him play better by telling him, yo, these guys are sweating. We're up two one. They're going to play worse. They're going to play scared. And Zeka was like, OK. That means I can play more aggressive, you know, and I can really ram it in and mm -hmm. like beat this guy up. Mm -hmm. And then they are able to do that, you know? So I feel like the the mental aspect is another really big one where like yeah. DRX mental right now is freaking diamonds. Yeah. it's It's been created under the highest heat and most pressure. Who was it in the interview who said like, my teammate told me to just tell myself I'm the best and I can do it. That was uh, Pioshik Pio yeah. because Juhan came up to him. It was Juhan, which yeah. Is, which is crazy because because Juhan is the person that's like supposed to replace you, you know? That's that's the pressure on you. But instead he's actually being his help. Exactly, I was like, him. oh my God, that is so <laughs> wholesome where he's coming up to him and he's like, he's taught, he was referencing, I believe Something. it was a Korean Olympian who yeah. there was this story about them. So, all right, can we get the full context? So you guys missed a little okay. bit. So what's the full story? Yeah, so the full story. Or you uh, full tell story is basically Piosik said in the interview afterwards that he was quite nervous. Yeah. But that Johan came up to him and said like, you're the fucking best and you're going to tell yourself you're the best every minute on that stage. You're just going to breathe in and keep convincing yourself how good you are or something along those lines. Right. And he said that in the interview too, he did that and he felt great. And then that's what helped him get a lot of confidence. Yeah. Crazy. And he got that strategy from this olympian that there was a story on yeah. Did it. yeah everyone's got like this That's mental buff cool. zeka is just like i don't know what he's been doing but this guy is he's the most in improved life, player yeah. i've ever seen from a summer split to a world championship uh death's just got plot armor beryl is just the biggest chad ever i was <laughs> i was talking to ashley kang and drake a bit before our cast and she was telling us how in some comms like especially on damon he would just pick a champ and he'd be like the coach would be talking about a champion and then beryl would all of a sudden say Hey, Nuguri, you can play Fiora, can't you? And he's like, yeah. He's like, you're a good Fiora. He's like, yeah. Okay, I'm locking it in. Boom, locks it in. You know, things like that. He's done that multiple times, you know. He's like the kind of guy where he's just like, it's so logical that he wonders why we haven't just done it. You know, it's just like, just go Nash. It's like, what? Yeah, just go Nash. Like, guy, can we just do this? You know, he's like, he's the epitome of a Giga Chad in comms. And I think his his way of like being able to talk a lot has helped Deft like relieve a lot of the stress of just being able to, being a voice and allows him to play a lot more focused. And then Kingen, Kingen's just, He's like the unsung hero of DRX. Yeah. No one talks about King and much, but this guy is like, he's playing top lane to a level that I was, I never thought I would see from him. I think when I went to Korea in season seven and I boot camped and I got like really high low, King and was on that, in that solo queue ladder, of course. And his name was just King and, and he just was a Quinn Renekton one trick. <laughs> and he was at like 1000 LP and he was, he was really good. And now all of a sudden just seeing him like four or five years later on a world's finals is just crazy to me. I, this guy's growth has been, has been really impressive, I think. I think the only reason he's getting overshadowed is because of Zeka, yeah. right? And you're like, oh my God, just because the other solo There's laner. so many stories. Zeka so, is his best friend and then King I, and convinced him. I have to him. come back to something. I have to come back to something. So earlier you said that you felt the Genji collapsed, right? So something I want to bring up is being on the analyst desk that day, the thing that impressed me the most is I felt that DRX won four out of the four drafts. I think you can argue maybe they didn't win the game one draft. But the game one draft was the uh, they had Camille Sejuani, Azia, Misfortune, Soraka. That was DRX's draft. That was DRX's. And enemy team had like this is one of those drafts where you're playing Sejuani into Tum, Camille Sejuani yes. into Tum. And yes, oh. that's that was the one where I sat there and said, like, the comp in isolation actually looked very good. Yeah. But when you looked at their limited engage into the Tom Kench, I felt like the Tom Kench answer was very good from Gen G. Yeah. And then when you kind of looked at the early game and you saw that DRX weren't doing much, I think that was a combination of one being very nervous playing in that arena. On a, on a stage like that, mm. there probably wasn't much pressure on their shoulders, but it's hard not to 
I can't believe that you're sitting there thinking to yourself, I'm one series away from the world finals mm. in your first game. I imagine there's a, a couple of nerves coming in there. Um, but then you're right. They were limited in terms of what they could do. But aside from that, like they had Gragas, Kindred, Ari, Kate Lux. They prioritized the Kate Lux and they gave up the Graves with the Kindred answer. I just think, oh, I just think, Gen G's responses just don't make sense. No, but like that's draft. that's totally fine, yeah. right? No. But my point is that like whether it was Gen G falling short in terms mm. of their draft or like personally, I just felt that DRX constantly had really good drafts. And yeah, like in game 100%. two, they fell behind again. But the thing I kept talking to Mark Z was, he was like, I don't know if I have faith in DRX players to operate this comp because it's, it's a really long range comp. You have no reliable engage. You're very reliant on getting picks, being two objectives first, mm. and the execution level is incredibly high. And I think that the fact that the Caitlyn Lux died in the bot lane against Rula after trying to get a gank two, you were like, there's no way they can win this game. And then they win it anyway, because the number of options that Genji had and the limited impact that Peanut could have meant that DRX could just continue to control the map. And then they only got more and more confident as the series went on. And that to me was the biggest thing that separated DRX versus Genji. DRX came in with a very clear, I don't even know if it's a clear plan, but they were so like, they showed like different champions every single game. They knew what their priorities were. They knew where they had strengths. And it felt like that they had a very clear win condition in every single game, which was the biggest difference between them and, and Gen G. And that to me is what impressed me because not only did they have a good win condition, but they were very good at playing towards it as well. So mm. that I felt like DRX just stomped Gen G. Mm. I felt like that they came in way better prepared and they and their their read on, on the meta was better. But I can see you shaking your head. Tell me why you disagree. I think so I'll start with like, I'll go backwards a little bit here. Sure. And I know you want to jump in as well, so I'll be as quick as possible. So game four, big throw on the support blind pick. Nautilus into that brown was the worst, the worst blind pick I've ever seen in my life. Like even just blinding Rakan there and just taking a Leona in the face is really fine. Picking like picking Nautilus there and allowing them to have like virus brown kindred into your into your free melee champs. It's just it's suicide. I think this was really stupid. The Varus Karma ends, I didn't really like it into Caitlyn Lux, that you're in a draft meeting after winning game one and you're saying, okay, we're red side, we're going to leave Caitlyn up and play Varus Karma into it. Yes, they went fine in lane phase, but I actually think their comp overall was even if not better against uh, DRX's comp. They just threw the game away. Like you're playing Orin Grave Silas on season 12 patch. Yeah. I think that's probably one of the strongest top sides you could ask for, especially on red side. Against like a, a, a Gragas Kindred Ari feels a little bit... It was... A little bit... Not off meta, but past meta, you know, like Ari's fallen off a little bit. Silas can do really well into Ari, doesn't struggle in lane phase. Graves is a stronger version I mean, of Kindred. Zekka right? felt like in that matchup, yes. he struggled in that match. Chovy struggled in that matchup. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he did actually. I remember those like 20 like CS steps. Yeah. So I, I don't think, now I don't want to just discredit Chovy here, but I don't think Silas into Ari, you go down 20 CS and like lose two plates in your tower and then allow the enemy jungle to just press one Herald button and take your mid tower. So I'll have to rewatch and see if he took bad trades or he got ganked. But off the top of my head, I think the lane phase should not go like that, I think. Um, but I don't want to be the person who's just discrediting DRX and just being like, no, no, it's this fault, this fault, this fault, this fault. Because I actually think they played insanely well. Zeka especially, like fantastic series. There's just like, I, I look at, I always look from the loser side. That's just sure. how I analyze. I'm like, what could you have done better to stop them from being able to beat you? Right. And I do that majority of the time through every matchup. And I think that that's why I'm so critical of like teams like Gen G and EDG. And I'm kind of sitting there wondering why they're doing specific things. The biggest standout is the is the Nautilus Prime Prime pick, giving them Caitlyn when you're gonna play Varus Karma. Sure, game three draft. I don't know why they gave him a Kali. Like all of a sudden, they just decided that giving him a Kali is a good idea, despite them denying it the whole series long. Even though it went, I think the Akali wasn't even picked in the one, well, two, three. They no. didn't even ban it in four, five. They like didn't. I didn't get it. I, I, yeah, the, well, what I had wanted to jump in uh, on the DRX side for the, like the main two, I think positives that have driven a lot of their success in draft and, yeah. and like their hold on the meta has been down to two players zeka and barrel because they've they've a lot of their team comps they start with these two like really big advantages where they jumped on the train of pushing bottom lane super early T teams in the meta have made like this this shift over to having like omega priority for for pushing bottom lane and then zeka has perf little perfect champion pool for this meta for mid lane and he Omega diffed Chovy. Like it was crazy. And the funniest part about that Ari game, you're talking about the Ari into Silas one, you know, in the interview afterwards, the reason he said the reason he even picked Ari was because Chovy was playing it and Chovy played it so well against him. He was like, well, it's only natural if your opponents are really good at something that you're going to learn it and get really good mm. at it too. 
And I was like, oh my God. And he destroyed him with his yeah, own I, freaking champion. Yeah. I was just like... I really wonder how that matchup goes on paper. Like if you were played a hundred times between two pros, just like what the actual average outcome is of Ari versus Silas. I mean, Ari should be able to win early, right? But I feel like Silas is one of those champs that would struggle more against like Azir because of the poke in lane rather than... Like Ari's damage is really low until like first base level five, three points Q. So it doesn't strike me as like the biggest poke champ in lane, but yeah. I guess post six, it's hard for him to kill or like push out. I think one of the biggest differences is regardless of if, if that Chovy play of like the flashing realm warp was, you know, super panic or whatever, was the confidence of the two mid laners. Ze Zekka's playing so aggressively in lane as well. Mm. Um, and it seems like Chovy, Chovy was very worried, you know? He was. I think Gen G were very worried about side lanes, especially. There was a few moments in yeah. that in that game where Chovy was getting caught on sides when it was very obvious they were moving to that side lane, he would just die. So I don't know if there was like a comms issue, but it just looks from the outside Main, like wave greed issue. Yeah, like I didn't look from the outside as as the series went on, they lost confidence in sides and you could see what Gen G were doing where they were dropping waves to be at the objective like 10 to 15 seconds earlier than they should be just because they were scared of getting caught on sides by especially like Zeka, right? Which just led to them bleeding gold. Um, but yeah, you're right, DRX. Outside of lane phase, they're really hard side lane players. Like they just want to, like they will just cover out a side to make sure it's fully pushed. And Deft and Barrel will always draft champions that can either contest or will always get mid push. Like Ash Heimendinger is the most extreme example of that. Estrial Karma is something that they really like to play to get that mid push. Uh, Varus Renata, make sure they get that mid push. Counter pick support on R5 into Nautilus. So just to give context to viewers who maybe like a lot of people join for the World Championship and you know they're trying to get educated. Yeah. When you say the mid push, you're talking about the mid game, right? When yeah. it comes to like what's super important in the mid game is having access to the river. Yeah. And so that's what that's the context you're talking about, right? So yeah, the way the game works is whoever has mid push in the mid game basically owns the map because you can either run to a topper bot and the enemy champion has to back away on that side lane, or you can get to the neutral objective first. And often what you'll see happen is you will have mid push, then you will walk to dragon. And the only thing that the enemy team can do is either face check you and die or go through the opposite side lane, like through bot, push out bot as four and then come and make it. So it's like a battle lines drawn face to face of the dragon fight. But because you're there first, it's always benefiting you, right? So champions that are range supports, especially Soraka, you know, Lux, Caitlyn, Karma lanes, Renata lanes, Braum into the melee champs. This gets you mid push in the mid game because you're either first on the wave and you can push it in or they can't contest you 2v2 and like step up and get the wave in. That's why you'll often see some ARAMs around like dragons and heralds spawning too, because in order to contest that, people will just use numbers, right? Yeah. It so doesn't 3v2, matter yeah, if you have Ezreal Karma, I'm going to send all five people mid to help push out that wave. Like, like j just for context, sorry to interrupt you, but just no, this on. is Beryl's last 10 games of support champs. I'm just going to read it off Kobe's screen here. Lux, Caitlyn, Ashheimer, Esrielheimer, Draven Soraka, Kalista Ash, Esriel Karma, MF Soraka, Caitlyn Lux, Varus Renata, Braum into Nautilus. That is Soraka mid really push, push in the mid game, no matter what. And, and Soraka may be debatable, yes. but that's the rest the, for And sure. that's also the champ select point I'm talking about with the with the duo, even in, in lane phase, pushing yeah. pushing hard. Perma bottom. push. Just so. push, 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 push. Yeah. So and, and they jumped on that super early. Yeah, and I think the push, 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 you know what, it alleviates a lot. Just we'll go back to bot lane now quickly. A lot of game stuff here. I hope we're not overcomplicating things. No, that's what. What happens for. if you're a mid laner yeah, and I have bot push? What happens as a mid laner? Yeah. Well, you get worried about support. Yeah, worried exactly. about support. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So what innately happens is when you're playing a Kali and Silas, a mid lane champ that's vulnerable to a bad lane phase, if the enemy team has bot push and the enemy supports hovering around, you can never poke him on the tower. So the basically, if you can draft these uh, meta champions that are heavy skirmishes that struggle in the early lane phase till six because you have bot push, so that makes it so you can go even, right? So I think it just frees up the map a lot, especially uh, for, for Zekai if they have this bot push. And more teams should do it. You ask me like, so it's got all these positives, what's the negatives? It can die very easily. And if you die and lose that push, you are useless for the rest of the game. Well, we saw that in game two versus Gen G, right? But then they weren't able to like claw anywhere back. And this yeah. is also where huge props to Zeka and King and- Zekka's flanks, I can't get over his vision pocket flanks. They're yeah. incredible, sorry. So, what, so I'm getting mixed signals right now, Mark, yeah. because I should call you Kedral, but... Um, <laughs> um, Did you know, before you continue, your name's Andrew. Oh my God. My name's Mark, his is Sam. So our initials are A-M-S. So we can do Sam with our initials. Anti-magic shield. Yeah. <laughs> <-magic. laughs> okay, well, I, I have to challenge you on this because originally you said that you were disappointed by Genji in yeah. terms of their performance. Now you're giving me a lot of positives for DRX. Yeah. And obviously no game is ever as clear cut as this team bad, this team good. Yeah. So give me your summary of the semifinal series and your 
impressions after you know its conclusion. Uh, just summary. I can try and like sum up what I just said basically. Uh, Genji underperformed bad answers to things that were obvious that DRX would pick. So I think they had a few poor drafts, game two and four especially. Or no, game three and four especially, giving over Akali and not betting on 4-5 didn't make much but sense. But do you think they were limited in their draft options and no, that was the problem? they can easily draft around this. Lehens yeah. has a great champion pool. There's no need to blind pick Nautilus with Zaya. These, okay. these last two are what we call unforced errors to borrow from tennis. Yeah, like that... Yeah, Gen G has been really flexible this year. They have okay. played so many different styles. They've played through both side lanes. They've played, I mean, even in the first game, they've just blinded Senna Cinch. Like that just ends, shows you how much they can dig deep to find things, right? For sure. They will pick anything they need. Um, and this was else? this was big big blunders in uh, in the drafts in game game three and four. Uh, but I, I'll credit DRX a lot. The way that they set up fights, the way that they flank, especially. I want to touch on it more. Zek has like conscious way of like finding vision pockets through through dragons is so important like the way a big reason why the west was weaker than the east coming into this tournament was because of team fighting and like yeah the west was just getting sucked into head on 5v5s me press or an ult me engage my azir will do damage we're both front to back we're both scaling whereas teams like the east were playing carry tops and skirmish heavy mids which will just flank you so you're getting sandwiched in and now your carries are exposed and all of a sudden the west is like oh crap we have to play carries as well to make it very skirmish heavy game and that's basically what you saw in this series like chovi was on a control mage and there is zeka and uh and king and are playing things like fiora or or ari or silas or akali whatever it may be and flanking you in your face and you I mean, Gragas also created a lot of chaos TP in the middle flank of those as well, fights, yeah. Yeah. so oh, i would say if you wanted like a definitive answer i think this was 60 percent drx playing very well 40% Gen.G blundering and drafting game that could have actually made it so they would pick up an extra game or two. Kobe? I also want to add on the, the like the importance of playing with that confidence and it it being such a difference, I feel like, for these two teams. Gen.G were also doing really poorly in scrims, they were saying. And so like that whittles away at it. And then if you make some mistakes in the opening games, then you start to play more cautiously, more conservatively. Mm -hmm. Then you're you're not pushing as hard to get this vision, not pushing as hard to check the enemy team. They get to get so much more for free yep. because you're scared already. And it leads to that kind of like snowball in a series. Yeah, maybe I'm just too harsh. But when I see things like I have a very specific way of thinking about how the game should be played sure. right Something and especially like in drafts i'm a very big draft advocate and when i see these mistakes at a world's finals as world semi-finals level i just get really frustrated i'm just saying like why why would you do this right why are you drafting yourself into these holes for no reason um so yeah i think genji also didn't look like they had much confidence either there was so never any like huge plays they would go for in that terms of for like, me is why i would probably put more like 70 to 75 for drx mm. if we're looking at percentages just because the individual performances from drx were world class in my opinion i think zeka is yep. a world-class mid laner I and agree. i think that like pioshik i think had one of the best series he's ever had in his career he's like, the best tournament of his life right like and it's it's like his his kindred was awesome i loved watching his kindred mm. um and i think that these things for me put it over the edge where like i think all of your points are super valid about gen g but some of the individual players that I'm like, even if they had a better draft, do I think Chovy suddenly plays better than Zeka? And my argument would be no. I, I think Zeka was just the better mid in that series. Yep. And, and draft differences would have changed certain things about the game and maybe it would have been less one-sided. But do I think the outcome would have changed? Deep down, I believe that Pyoshik and Zeka was the better mid jungle in that series. And even if you fix the draft, that doesn't suddenly change. I think of it holistically, and that's why I'm like so heavy on on DRX because these are all parts of the game. These, this is part of playing in a tournament mm. are all these different factors that you're working in. And so while, yes, you could have, they seem like easy corrections and draft corrections seem mm. easier than like in-game corrections playing better or something like that. I, I, I count them all, you know, in the package basically of playing worlds. And so I give a bunch of, you know, all the credit. I have to move this on. I know, but I was just going to say, I suppose I the last thing I'll say is... Can you bring it you, up in the T1 versus DRX yeah, no, no, the last thing, last thing, I promise, I promise. The, the last thing is, I think another big reason why I'm very hard on Genji is if you watch their regular season, I watched every single one of their games. That right, game yeah. one of that series was Genji in the regular season. It was really fucking boring, <laughs> yeah. but it was just good. <laughs> yeah. And it was just winning games. And you just sat there and it was like, well, you're really boring, but you're winning. So I guess fine, you know. Sure. And then you see those games, and you're like, wait... What, where, where's the last yeah. like 60 games of Gen G been? What the hell, you guys, since the start of summer, we're doing the opposite of everything I'm seeing on my screen. So it's like, oh God. Yeah, I remember hey. on, on, our, on our analyst desk, I was yeah. like, 
Cho it's because Chovy and, and Ruler are the two most reliable carries. Sure. This is why it's going to be so easy. You know, they showed so much of it. And I was like, game one, boom. See, that's exactly what I'm it's talking about. Like the sample about. size is this big for how consistent they are. Then all of a sudden they're just trash. And it's like, what the hell happened? That That's a fun note, Sorry. by the way. Yeah. I got flamed a bunch by a bunch of Korean fans because I had all the Gen G like records against DRX yeah. this year. And like people were taking that screenshot out of context. And I was like, guys, this is literally just the results of Genji versus yeah, Derek. There's something Stadia you can do here. about it. It was like an eight game win streak. Oh no, it was a 12 game win streak. They're yeah. eight and zero over the last year. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Anyway, I have to talk about the final matchup now, T1 versus DRX. You've obviously shared a lot of opinions on DRX. You've shared a lot of opinions on T1. I'm already feeling that both of you are edging more towards T1. Yeah, but 100%. before I get into the predictions, which you've already spoiled, um, Kobe, what did you want to say? No, I think I just wanted to say real quick, I think it's important to make that clear before you play these matchups because that's what makes upsets so special. That's what yeah. makes DRX's run through this tournament the most legendary run through it's worlds insane. ever. Agreed. Is because every single best of five that they have played for all of summer, they have been the underdogs. Yep. You know, they're the lower right. percentage. They're not My supposed to win. So you can say, you know, you want DRX to win or you can even predict that they are going to win. Yeah. But... The odds, stacking them up, looking at it on paper, T1 should be advantage. I mean, you know? I mean, yeah. What, and then that makes if DRX beat them and upset them even more important and special. I mean, yeah, DRX had a tough group with the second LPL team seed who'd like almost beat JDG, right? And like EU's first seed. So people were like, hmm, maybe they'll get out of groups. You know, Rogue was the only, not the only belief, but like the strongest team coming out of Europe, right? Then they go in the quarterfinals against the world champs and it's like LPL and best of fives. I don't know. And then they beat the first seed from the LCK who beat down one who looked like the tournament favorites as well. Um, I said well, I start him in tournament though. I'm going to flex here. T1, Dan, one of my winners. So I'm sticking with T1 the whole <laughs> way. But I still cannot believe that Piosik gets to pick two. has gone from being 216 in a regular season last year to making play-ins and now he's in a world finals. <laughs> like if you told me at the start of this year that Piosik's making the world finals, I would laugh at you for two weeks straight and block you everywhere and yeah. say that you are the craziest person I've ever met. Please stop talking about League of Legends. Just look at his last couple of years in career and your career. Ah, this guy's just turned the whole ship around. I love his interview afterwards too, where he talked about that and he was like, and it doesn't matter now because we're winning. <laughs> like, He's a giga chat. Like, it's like, doesn't matter now. <laughs> it's what, craziest what turnaround. What gets me I love it. is imagine how different this tournament could have been if Derek ended second seed instead of first. Who would they have, they have faced JDG? It would have been JDG. Oh. It would have been JDG. Uh, oh. And then Rogue and then would have been T1. against EDG, right? Like, it would have been a completely different tournament and our whole narratives would be crazy. And it's, it's one of those things about the format that, like, is both beautiful and depressing, mm. right? Which is that, like, I think that, like, Sooning's run is a very, not a direct comparison, but a similar one in terms mm. of the expectations versus where they ended up. And I think that it's not unreasonable to sit there and believe that DRX is sim heading in a similar fashion where, whereas Sooning kind of, they went through many obstacles on their way to get to where they did. They then ended up falling short in the 3-1 final. And I think the expectations will be that DRX are still the underdogs, right? Um, yep. So let's talk a little bit about that. Super underdogs. Good, I, they like it that way. Yeah, I mean, of course they do. But do you do you think, what do you, what's your score prediction? Let's start there, Kobe. I'm going to go 3-2. We're getting all five games for the movie ending. For who, though? Who wins? Worlds this year. T1. T1 How cool T1 would it be, wins. right? <laughs> if it does end 3-2 in like a base race, right? Or either team wins, right? Yeah. It's so emotional and celebratory. Everyone's crying. And then League of Legends ceases to exist. And that's it. That's the final moment yeah. of League of Legends ever. End. Everyone's computers. League of Legends gets Game deleted. Over. Riot Games like shuts down League of Legends. It's only Valorant now. League of Legends <laughs> never existed. And then you wake up in your bed in like 2008. It's all a dream. <laughs> and you're like, oh, wow. And you were making an anime out of it. What a great movie. Yeah. Uh, I'll say 3 1 T1. I think T1's probably going to win this By the series. Most generic analyst answer ever. Yeah. Uh, so, one thing I think is super cool, though, for the matchup is well, okay, there's way more than one thing, mm. but one more thing that I wanted to touch on, um, and we'll probably touch on the, uh, in the cast also. I think it's really cool that positioning, yes, you know, Faker opposite Deft. Um, as the 26 year olds, you know, same high schools, born in the same year, 10 year careers, debuted in the same year, is that both of them are getting retested by these exceptional, super young, like Zoomer players in their position. Zeka has arisen to just be the, 
the the only one that can possibly answer Faker in this tournament as a mm. mid laner. He has dominated everybody else. And so now we're getting this like, okay, you're 26 years old, Faker. Can you still do it versus Zekka, who is like the new you know, star of the tournament? And then Deft are like, okay, can you do it versus Guma and Karia? Best bottom lane in the world where Guma's playing confidently again, where Guma's actually playing well again. Mm. And it's like a perfect like ending test Oof. for both of them. Meanwhile, not top lane's gonna be Kragas versus not even, Sejuani, Not even against it? each other, but versus the other teams like young talent. You've sold me, Kobe, you've sold me. Yeah. I mean, your, yeah, your it's super good. hype. I hope that we get the full five games, but like let's break, dive into the matchup a little bit more. I'm gonna start with the jungle because I think that this is the least talked about role when it comes to this matchup, and I'm going to put you both to the test. Owner versus Pioshik, right? Can you tell me what the differences between the players are? Anything that stands out to either of you? Do you think they're actually very similar in terms of play style? Um, because when we think about this matchup, we don't think jungle, but obviously the junglers are very important to the mm. success of both their teams, so... So thoughts on yeah. the jungle matchup? I think Owner is a bit more flexible, and I think he has one edge that he's... I think he's the better Graves player than Piosik. For sure. I think Piosik struggled on Graves. I think he had like one group stage game against Top Esports that was fine, but he played Graves in... I don't... Against... I can't remember who played Gra Graves against. I think it was EDG maybe, and they but lost. But now he's, we know that he'll um, leave Graves open and pick Kindred into it, Anyway, right? exactly right. That's the answer, right? He has Kindred into Graves. So uh, I think Owner is slightly more flexible and better Graves, but Piosik has pocket pick responses, and I think they're both similar in the way that... Um, they are very, they won't power farm. They're like very three, four camps into gank or hover for gank or vision pocket a gank, especially top side in the early stages. Yeah, I was gonna say their biggest similarities are actually in their responsibilities to their teams. Cause I feel like they both have to do similar things for their for, for their teams to actually operate. Yep. And like, that's the only, you know, of, of course Kindred and being named after Kindred and being a Kindred streamer for forever or whatever hmm. um, is is like the the main difference in, in champion style, but also, the Kindred into Graves matchup is Kindred has outplay potential and has scaling potential. Yeah. Um, but I still feel like early, it, it's up to the Graves to dictate. And of course, your lane matchups are all going to yeah, play into how you're going to dictate. But I feel like Graves gets to try and dictate early. And if he does not succeed, then Kindred gets to stack marks. And you always have the options with Kindred with Q and E slow mm. to be able to choose. Yeah. The only issue, I have a couple things I want to say about the Kindred. Number one, you need a tank top when you play Kindred. You cannot play things like Kindred Fiora, Kindred Camille. It's just, well, so it far, doesn't they've, work. Well, so far, they've played it with Gragas both times. Gragas yeah. both times. Yeah, that makes sense. Anything that's a tank top or can weak side or is a frontliner. So that exposes a whole different conversation where if they early rotate Kindred, they have to play engage top and you're giving a blind pick tank in, into the, one of the best top laners in the world, like you'll pick GP into it or something. Sure. And how much is that going to affect the rest of the game, right? And how much can the Kindred get done versus giving Zeus a GP? Yes, he can pick it into other carries, but at least you can fight back on side lanes, right? The tank just has to sacrifice that lane. The other wonder I have is what's the draft going to look like? I think DRX are always going to pick blue because what's your red side bans is T1, right? If you ban Yumi, or Aatrox already, then you're already not targeting Akali Silas. You're not targeting Kindred. And these are things that they will want to early rotate. Caitlyn as well is another but. one. So there's only like five champs that I can think of that need to be banned, that DRX need to figure out how to get their hands on. So if T1 banned things like Yumi, Aatrox, Akali, then all of a sudden you've got Silas and Caitlyn up and, and things so, like this. So What I will say in that is both teams have come up with pretty clever answers to certain things. I think it was Chovy that introduced the rise into Silas matchup initially. It was Faker. T1 JDG. Though. I'm pretty confident yeah. it was it was the but it was Chovy against Damwon. It was Chovy. It was Chovy against, against Damwon. Yeah. yeah. You're right. And he's the one that brought the rise out. He didn't bring it out into, into Silas but he brought rise out. And I do wonder if this inspired Faker to do the same. Uh, maybe they were scrimming or maybe he just I don't mm. know. It, it, I don't know the origin story but Faker has shown that his rise not only is it good into Silas but he will blind pick it. Um, and this is something that you then like, I know Niski would bring out the Casio as an answer to Rise, mm. right? But Rise is a difficult champion to answer. And like Azia was something that in the olden days, it was Rise gets pushed early, but then Azia offers more in team fights because of his range, but he doesn't have the same side lane mm. threat and so on and so forth. Um, but to me, it feels like the, the, the finals ends up becoming a series of answers. Yeah. And you talked about Kindred. 100%. We've already seen things like Varus is very popular between the two AD carries. Yeah. And then I wonder like, well, does something get answered or does Var Varus become the most popular AD carry? Three things. Quick question before I begin those three things. Yeah. T1 bot lane plays Ashheimer, right? Uh, yeah. They have played they it. Have. Yeah, they have. Okay, so I think the three things we'll see in the series' answers is Rise into Silas, 
Galio into Akali might be what Faker's sure. response is to Zek as Akali. Maybe. And Ashheimer into Caitlyn first pick. So a T DRX or T1 need to be very aware if they're first picking Caitlyn and Ashheimer's open, they are going to get pushed in and it's going to be a losing lane. Also have to be aware of like, this is Faker's counters to um, Akali and Silas. He's, this is just Faker but in a nutshell. But does Ashheimer even win again? Does it, can't Caitlyn's range actually hit the... Uh... I think Ashheimer pushes in every lane in the game. I might be wrong. But they, I think that they will get the push in. I think they'd have to go Caitlyn Karma over Caitlyn Lux or something to contest. But a part of me feels that like they're more inclined to answer with like a Varus Renata rather than an Ashheimer. If if your mm, T one spot lane, perhaps. Anyway, we're going down the rabbit hole way too much. That's not where I wanted to yep. go. Um, yeah, I mean, you started asking about jungles. I did. I did. That's <laughs> oh, yeah, why. Where I have we gone? <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. So yeah, good insight on the jungle matchup. I appreciate that. Let's very quickly talk about the top lane matchup. And Nivia into Silas. Great, good it was idea. Gam who did that. Yeah, good point. He was playing it a bunch in Champions Queue too. I thought there was going to be other people Bruh. start playing it. Faker Anivia, could we get it? Does a no. little bird dance. A Anivia into Rise is also a really good matchup. Yeah, it, that it was is. always really good. Yeah. Sorry, Vadius, we're just going to stop sidetracking. You know? It's fine. Tell me about top lane. Go. Why, top lane. why are you just asking questions though? You're also an analyst. Yeah, you're an analyst yeah, too. I know, but I'm also. I'm not an analyst. I can't go to Yemen. Yeah, but so every now and then I'll throw in my <laughs> opinions. I mean, I, I think that. Top lane is where we see the biggest discrepancy, I think, throughout the entire matchup. Um, I think that Zeus is just strictly better than Kingen. That's my opinion. I think that he has an incredibly deep champion pool, and no matter what Kingen does, Zeus has a counterpick to it. And I need someone to show me an answer to Yone. I think the only good answer is Renekton, but you will get outscaled, and if you die, you're problematic. You've got an answer. You got the an answer? best answer to Yone? Gank his ass. Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. Yeah. Actually, the That's best. That's the most Kobe it's response ever. <laughs> it's actually the best. It's, it is actually, in practice, the, the best. Just too. gank his ass. Okay. Gank his ass. Gank his ass. Gank it out of there. Uh, so yeah. I also realize I've been told we're talking too much. Um, <laughs> um, so we've only got like 10 minutes left. Mm. So in this space, I want you. You're very direct on how you want this podcast yeah, to go. Yeah, I've got to like, lead like it. That's what. Yeah, I am. Like I got to control we're, you. We're way too we, went to, we went to school. We went to school. School, school. together. School. 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 No, don't bring the wow up again. Do not bring the wow up again. Don't you dare. We're talking about wow now? No. I will give you. We've got 10 minutes left. So because we didn't get to talk about all the matchups, we did talk about Gumiushi, we did talk about Faker at some point in this podcast. <laughs> so what is your most excited thing about the finals matchup? Tell me. And you have time to talk about you it. You gotta pick you, one thing. You gotta pick one thing. The thing that you are most looking forward to in the finals matchup. Uh, the is, thing, it, is it a player or is it a thing? Whatever you want. Anything. I would just want one. I'm looking forward to casting it with Kobe and kinda Flowers. Kind of cringe. Kind of cringe. I'm really excited to get my first Not world finals cast. Not cringe at all. I'm like, it's gonna be amazing. <laughs> but about the game specifically, I just, I'm just, I am a draft lover. I love drafts. I love sure. talking about drafts. I love seeing drafts. Massive I love nerd. going through like a thousand million scenarios of drafts in an Excel sheet to find one answer to the most random question ever that I don't need to know the answer to. So I'm looking forward to the answers of what the RX and T1 have to each respective pick. Yeah. Like the answer to Yone, the answer to Salas, the answer to Kali, the answer to what Faker's blind pick Rice is going to be from Zeka. Uh, how are they going to prioritize me? Do they want to really rotate it? Because if you think about it, that series, Gen G versus DRX, I can't remember which one it was, but Akali and Silas were open, I think. And then Chovy wanted to pick Rise into Silas against DRX's red side, but they didn't actually pick mid. They held it till three because they were aware that Chovy would pick Rise into it. So eventually what happened was they picked Rise on two, three blind, I think. And then I can't remember what Zeka's response is. But anyway, they were very like aware of what the counters could be and they dropped certain picks. So it's not a case of like, here is my Pretty response. sure he picked Akali into the Rise. I think he picked a card, yeah, but he didn't blind Silas or something like this into it no, he didn't. Uh, because he knew Chovy would pick it. So yeah, I'm just looking forward to the responses and answers and how they figure out drafts. And I think these are the two teams which you cannot count out after game one. Like if they lose game one, they will, they're will they good teams at bouncing back and figuring out like changing the whole style or just like changing picks on the spot and not running it back. You know, it didn't work. Let's try it again. No, fuck that. Sure. We're going to change the plan. Swearing a lot today. I yeah, sorry. To Whoever is like editing this and has to like beep out all the beeps, you know, <laughs> you can make, wait, I can just say beep and you can just edit that over. Okay. Beep. Be okay, Kobe, <laughs> Kobe, go. You're going you're gonna to beep yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Self-censor. Yeah, self-censor. Okay, Jeez. Kobe. I, so on that point though, I was trying to figure out, that was one of the things I was trying to figure out yesterday was not even just answers, but What's, what makes to me the most memorable series are when there are unforeseen champions that come out that have We've a big strength. We've already seen like 110 though. But there's still more. We have the <laughs> most creative supports in the world. LCK actually sent all psychopaths. Uh, with, are you a psychopath? Get on with, the plane. Caria, yeah. <laughs> Lehens, and Barrel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I, I, I was going so deep uh, down uh, support pools to yeah. try and pull out more support champions. 
I think I mentioned this on the last podcast also. Actually, talking to trying to talk to Corje and come up come up with more from him too. He thinks the the Zyra um, can also do a lot of similar things. I think uh, silent the Heimerash as well to the Heimer Dinger mm. um, and go for those push lanes and and even go for kill lanes too. Because Ash Zyra, the, one of the biggest things was also the map control with Hawkshot into you can just always push and as soon as you're six, you can just insta kill someone with both ults snare. You can anyways. Uh, <laughs> I was like, when the, I said I had 10 minutes, so yeah. <laughs> the, the champion pool that I'm looking for, hopefully surprise pick that is going to make people go wow, is either the bottom lane, probably the supports, or Faker. Faker. Faker could pull out. Faker's played so long. His champion pool is so deep. He can definitely have a surprise moment still on stage. But if I picked one thing... Oh, that wasn't your one thing? Okay. No, tell me why you tell me Ooh, what you know what I want? I want no, you don't get to speak at all. What's Beryl's your one rel. thing? Stop it. What's your one thing, Kobe? His rel is I, iconic. I, I think it's just the ending to to this magical story of of Faker versus Death and, both and so the boring. last chapter because in the book. It's 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 actually it's just so many people have been playing League for so long, you know. Yeah. And there's always been this thing that like as you age, you're you're not as good anymore, you know. But it's a load of bollocks. It's a load of beep. Give me a beep. It's a load of beep bollocks. <laughs> um, <laughs> It, both these guys, are, and, and one of them is going to prove it, you know? I, and I yeah. love that that test is, is you know, has so many other stories surrounding it, but... It's it's a great thing to be excited now, about. What are you it's excited story. about? I'm excited about the mid lane matchup. I'm a mid laner myself. I love Akali. You've coached a bit of my Akali before. And, was I a good um, coach? You were okay, yeah. You are good. I was okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Well, no, he gave me some really good advice, which is like, I'm hyper aggro in lane. And he said, you need to stop trading into waves that are coming into you. And I was like, yeah, I probably should. <laughs> um, Let the waves come to you. Um, but yeah, the mid lane matchup is super exciting to me. I think that like a part of me doesn't fully believe in Zeka yet. Huh? A part of me, yeah. That's what I'm saying. A part huh? of me, a, a part of me thinks that like fa a Faker is just all round better than Zeka is, and he won't give him the advantages that he has. Um, Faker is very good at nullifying mid laners, yeah. and shutting them down to stop them from like. He's being the impressive. uncillable demon and dodging king, baby. Ganks. He absorbs so much pressure. Actually, you know, Zeus Faker all movement. Right, yes, it's lovely and great, but I have to end the podcast now because we all talk. That's kind of boo. Everyone, yeah. everyone in the comments, boo, Vedi is rending it. Don't boo, Vedi has Thank to end the podcast. Where's the bus driver? We've got to go. We won't we'll even finish it. talking, but we've got to go. Now, we wish we could keep on talking. We wish you a Merry Christmas, boo. That's how long we want to go on for. And the crew needs to get going. Uh, thank you to everyone that tuned in during our run throughout the world 2022. If you watch us on YouTube or listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts, we're available everywhere. Go check us out. Uh, thank you to Harmonic Brewing Thrive City for hosting us. If you're in the area doing the finals or attending Fan Fest this weekend, check out Harmonic Brewing right next to the Chase Center. The World Finals is here right behind us. This place. Yep, that's the one. Uh, this Saturday at 5 p.m., where either DRX or T1 will be crowned the 2022 League of Legends World Champions. Don't miss it. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a wonderful winter break, and we'll see you for the finals. Take care. Bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, bye now. Bye. Bye.